Welcome to What's the Deal, JP Morgan's investment banking series on the Making Sense podcast channel. I'm David Rawlings, your host and country head for JP Morgan Canada. I'm thrilled to be joined by Michael Semblist, Chairman of Market and Investment Strategy at JP Morgan Asset and Wealth Management. Michael, thanks for returning to the podcast. You're welcome. We're thrilled to have you back. We had you on the podcast middle of last year. But before we begin, why don't you just give the listeners a quick recap of your role here at JP Morgan? Well, I'm the chairman of market investment strategy for the asset management business, which includes the four trillion or so under supervision on behalf of endowments, foundations, sovereign wealth funds, insurance companies, and pension plans, and then also for individuals up and down the wealth spectrum. It sounds like an important and daunting task. So thanks for being with us and sharing with us some of your views on the economy, markets, et cetera, as we enter 2024. So we were together about six months ago, and we talked about a number of themes, including the U.S. economy, currency diversification, decarbonization. Listen, many of those themes, I think, remain consistent today, but you've introduced a number of new topics within the Eye of the Market 2024 outlook. I'd like to spend time today focused on those topics. So firstly, I just thought the cover art was fabulous. It shows a bunch of bears actually landing on a bed of pillows, if you will, indicating potential for soft landing. I think that's probably a change in your thinking, and maybe you start there and walk us through what you're seeing. Yeah, I mean, five or six months ago, the leading indicators were all pointing down. They're still pointing down. It's just the trajectory of them is less bad than they were. Whereas a few months ago, it looked like maybe you'd have a recession, let's say one to one and a half percent of GDP decline. Now, it may be, if you get a recession, it's a pretty mild one. And what looks to be more likely now is a slowdown to something around zero in the second quarter. But things are shaping up reasonably nicely for the Fed to be able to cut by mid-year. Consumer price inflation is slowing. Wage inflation is rolling over. It's taken a lot longer than the Fed had hoped, but it finally looks like some of those things are starting to pan out. In the report, you identify a number of leading indicators. But it's interesting that you said, well, our preferred leading indicator, which is ISM new orders, less inventories, is actually improving. Is that something you want to read into? The reason why it's our preferred indicator is because the ISM survey has a closer connection for investors with the bottom and the equity markets. So there's other indicators that look a little bit worse, but they tend to take place deeper into the economic cycle. So when you look back over the seven or eight post-war corrections, if you were able to identify a bottoming in the ISM data, that was typically the closest you could get to the bottom in the equity markets. So that's the reason why we spend so much time looking at it. Got it. And not to push on the spot even further, but if you were to have a bias to a little better, a little worse, is your bias that it might even be a little better this year based on what you're seeing? I don't know. I mean, there's still a lot of softening in the pipeline related to tightening of bank lending conditions and the lagged inf impact of higher interest rates, collapse in residential commercial housing activity, exhaustion of excess savings, things like that. But right now, the consensus is a very mild, soft landing with limited impact on the markets. And I would say that's pretty much priced in at this point. Yep, agreed. So let's shift and spend a little time on stocks and sectors. I think you did some good work as you looked at the Magnificent Seven, so to speak, and its contribution both to earnings growth, but also to performance of S&P. It sounds like you feel like that can continue. So why don't we start there and take it further? Yeah, I mean, nobody in my position wants to spend the bulk of their time on U.S. equity markets looking at seven stocks, but that's where we are, right? They represent all-time highs in terms of their contributions to market cap and returns and percentage of earnings. And so the real question is, and has been for the last couple of years, are the valuations ridiculous or not? And the answer we come to is no. Now, whenever stocks are priced that richly in terms of multiples, there's room for them to go up or down a lot. But broadly speaking, if you look at free cash flow margins and earnings and other metrics, the multiple that these companies command look sensible relative to how much more profitable they are than the rest of the S&P. And so I think the most important chart is the one that looks at relative PE multiples adjusted by earnings expectations. Sure, the PE for these companies is higher than the rest of the market. You adjust those two numbers for earnings expectations and they look like they're priced very similarly. So there's actually an efficiency to this, which is that 
you pay higher multiples commensurate learning expectations. And that's why we included a four-page section in the outlook on antitrust, because unless that dynamic changes, it looks like you, you, you know, strong will continue to get stronger and those seven stocks will continue to outperform. Are these antitrust considerations related to the election cycle at all or independent? I think it's independent of that. Look, under the Trump administration, they started doing some antitrust investigations as well. I think this is less politicized than other things. Understood. Yeah. All right, let's th spend a little time on some of the value. You've identified industrials and energy as two sectors that might have some value going into this year. How are you thinking about those sectors? Right. I'll touch on that. Let me just talk about the antitrust issue for a minute. I mean, there's lawsuits going on with most of them. And in my opinion, we need to watch this space really closely because Google is spending 40 to 50 billion a year or so ensuring that device manufacturers either only have their browser as an option or set it as the default option. On Android phones, you've got to use Google billing services. Amazon has a deal where if you want placement in front of prime customers, you have to use Amazon fulfillment services. So we're getting closer with some of these DOJ and FTC lawsuits to where we might start seeing some of the business models have to change. And so anybody that's interested in this space, you know, there's a four page section in the outlook that's worth looking at because it walks through some of the legal issues. On industrials and energy, it's pretty straightforward. They're priced cheaply on a price to book and price to earnings basis versus the rest of the market. You've got an energy bill, a semiconductor bill, and an infrastructure bill. Most of those bills space out the spending over time. It's not like a stimulus injection in the next 18 months. But that said, in the world we now live in, countries are trying to reshore their supply chains. They're trying to reduce exposure on foreign governments for key supply chains in the renewable transition. All of these things contribute to more domestic infrastructure spending, which helps the industrial sector and the energy sector. The energy sector is a little bit of a special case. You could end up with a sector that has great cash flow generation, buybacks and dividends, but where the market never really rewards you as an investor with high valuations because of concerns over long-term stranded asset risks. And that's probably where we are. In our portfolios, we're happy to own energy as a value sector, and we're just careful not to extrapolate too much multiple expansion because it's, it's unlikely to occur. But the energy sector from 2010 to 2018 was a train wreck of unprofitability, right? I mean, we look back at the major big ticket capital spending expansions of the last 30 years in airlines, casinos, and fiber optic cable, and they were all surpassed by the lack of profitability in the energy sector. Then everyone gave it up for dead in 2018, 2019, and ever since then, cash flow generation has been high. So it's been interesting to see how quickly that's changed. And I agree. You also spent a bunch of time on the new weight loss drugs and not, not just its impact on healthcare, but maybe broader impacts. Yeah. Maybe spend a minute there. The markets have developed a shoot first and ask questions later mentality. So when you, a couple of years ago, whether it's the metaverse or hydrogen or crypto, you, you see these huge market moves. And then af after six, nine, 12 months, people start digesting the earnings information and the trends. And then, well, maybe we got in front of things too fast. You saw that a little bit over the summer. The Wagovi trial came out showing reasonable weight loss results and a 20% decline in cardiovascular events. And all of a sudden, everybody extrapolated tens of millions of prescriptions, Medicare coverage, private sector coverage. And as time passes, it's a little more complicated than that. The weight loss drugs work. They generally are going to help you lose up to 15, maybe 18% of your body weight over 40 weeks, and then it flatlines. There appears to be a modest benefit in the reduction of cardiovascular risk, osteoarthritis, sleep apnea, and things like that on the order of 20%. If the cumulative risk in a population was 8%, it goes to 6.5%. It's not earth-shattering, but it's better than nothing. But there's a lot of questions as to whether or not Medicare, which currently does not cover these drugs, is going to cover them when the long-term health benefits are on the margin. So I generally agree with the market bidding up the valuations of these GLP drugs. 
because they'll be very successful against type 2 diabetes and obesity. What I don't agree with yet is the market slamming the stock prices of companies that treat adjacent conditions under the notion that people aren't going to be suffering from them anymore. I think that goes way too far. There's about eight or nine trials currently ongoing, explicitly testing these drugs, not for weight loss and not for type 2 diabetes, but for a variety of other health conditions related to pancreatic issues, kidney issues, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, heart attacks, strokes. And obviously, if one of those hits, it's a bit of a game changer. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think your point of sometimes we react quickly, the market reacts quickly and then pulls back once it has more data. Yeah, and the example of that is the insulin manufacturers. They got crushed a few months ago. Now they've come back because the markets are like, well, wait a minute, let's see how long it's going to take to roll this stuff out. Yeah, I totally agree. And just a note to our listeners, if you're interested in hearing more about this topic, back in December, we released a research episode focused on the growing popularity of obesity drugs and the possibility of a paradigm shift in healthcare. There's a link to this episode in our description. Let's shift for a minute to the fixed income markets. You're in an environment where obviously the base rates are higher, but coming down a bit in the last couple of months with the Fed positioning and spreads remain relatively tight versus normal cycles. How are you thinking about both high yield and high grade? Well, the opportunity for investors is sometimes the windows are so narrow, right? I mean, the time when the 10-year was floating with 5% was pretty brief. And we saw that as a great entry target. It came, it went, and now the 10 years rallied a little bit. It's hard to get super excited about high yield and high grade. I mean, high yield spreads are close to the tightest levels they've been since 2009. Now, the high yield portfolio management community can rattle off a whole bunch of statistics at you to justify those levels. A better mix between double B and triple C, a lot more health in the energy high yield sector where a lot of the bad companies already defaulted, less use of pick bonds, a little bit better covenant protection, less participation by sponsors that are associated with higher default rates and lower recoveries. So, you know, they, they would argue that the risks are a lot lower. But as an investor, I think you've got to look at the high yield market and say, well, the spreads are really tight and the risks are lower. So you have to grit your teeth and decide if it's worth it. The best value was long duration, high grade bonds when the 10 year was at 5%. And by the way, have a little patience. We may end up back there depending upon how the funding pressures for the treasury work out this year. Yeah. Not fair. And I think that when I look at your recommendation for investors, I think it's clear that there is a diversified approach this year. So, you know, to your point on equities, there are going to be opportunities in equities, but cash actually feels pretty good still. And if the Fed's not going to cut rates till back half up next year, that feels like a decent place to park some capital. And then to your other point, just having some fixed income, it's a lot more attractive than it was a few years ago, but less attractive than a few months ago. Yeah. Where it makes the most sense is, is a lot of the tax-exempt endowment foundation and pension money, that's where some of the longer duration credit positions make sense. For taxable U.S. investors, it's, it's more difficult because they have to pay an ordinary income on it. Yep. Understood. Let's just spend a minute. It's a big election year, not just in the U.S., but really around the world. What are the potential implications of that? I think sometimes the geopolitical stuff gets overplayed. If you look back at the big elections, it's hard to identify really important changes in market economic conditions and vice versa. When you look at the biggest changes in the trajectory of markets, they don't have that much to do with politics, right? I mean, the big equity corrections of 2001 and then 2008 don't really have that much to do with the political dynamics that were taking place at the time. You could argue that the Trump tax cuts, the TCJA Act is an example of that and also the onset of the tariffs against China. So that was an example of where a presidential election ended up having a little bit more of an impact. But usually they don't matter that much. It remains to be seen if all this election stuff matters as much as people think, particularly in systems like the U.S., where the composition of the Senate may be as important, if not more important, than who wins the presidency. So fair. we're watching like everybody else, but... I'm not sure exactly how much it's going to actually do to change things. Understood. Let's just shift for a minute. I would say your outlook is always very thoughtful, and often you take non-consensus views on different topics. This year, you went one step further 
in honor of Byron Ween, and you put a top 10 surprises in the deck. So just talk us through that and maybe highlight a couple of them that you think would be most interesting. Yeah, I mean, the point of a surprise list is not to say, these are my general expectations, right? And what Byron did so well for 40 years was to say, look, I don't know if these things are going to happen. I'm not projecting them, but there are certainly things that should be on the table that investors should think about and weigh the risks and think about what they do if they did happen. And so I wanted to do a version of that in his honor. And I led with the dollar because as somebody that manages money, all I read about over the last 18 months is how the United States is weaponizing the U.S. dollar by putting sanctions on countries and therefore the rest of the world is going to move away from the dollar as the world's reserve currency and China is going to negotiate RMB contracts with the Saudis to pay for oil and the BRICs are going to have this generalized non-dollar block that's going to eat into the U.S. reserve currency status. So far, on a scale of 1 to 100, that transitions at a 4. And my projection is that not a lot of that is going to change this year. So for me, that was interesting. And for, for our clients that have currency exposures, that's important. I do think that the DOJ or the FTC will win one of these big lawsuits this year. I don't know which one, but I think they're going to win one of them. Then I also had something in there, Biden withdrawing from the race, which is more of an exercise in understanding the protocols in both parties in terms of what happens if a candidate withdraws either during the primary season or after the convention before the general election. So some of these things are really just meant as discussion topics rather than I'm putting this flag in the ground and this is definitely what's going to happen. Well, I thought they were very thoughtful in terms of the way they were written. And I also thought in addition to the U.S. dollar piece that you talked about, I think the U.S. economy could be a little stronger this year than we predict, which has a whole bunch of implications. And the thing I find interesting is if you look at the stats in 2023 versus 2019 even from a consumer point of view, most people are generally in a better position today than they were in 2019, but somehow they're more negative on the outlook. And I just keep thinking about that as why that might be. It's all about inflation. And so when you look at nominal income, particularly of median workers, the nominal income numbers look great. And then when you look at them on a real basis, net of inflation, they're way below trend. So a lot of people just got inflation to points of extreme unhappiness. And I think that's part of what's in the polling numbers. Now, those inflation numbers are starting to roll over. The United States is producing more oil and gas than it ever did before. They haven't done too much to prevent the industry from maximizing output. But yeah, I think it's an inflation story. It's also a housing story, right? Because when you have that kind of rate shock, everybody's stuck in their homes. It's very hard to move because you can't transfer a mortgage from one property to another. So you have a lot of people that, whose labor mobility is curtailed. Fair enough. No, fair enough indeed. Let's just shift to two more things. So one of the surprises you talked about with the regional banks, 2023 was obviously a tough year for many regional banks. It feels like there is stability today. And I think one of your quote unquote surprises could be that they actually have a better 2024. How do you think about that? For all the talk about the big U.S. banks, the U.S. has a thriving regional banking system that a lot of countries in Europe and Japan no longer have. They have a lot of friends on both sides of the aisle and in government who want to see that stay that way. And so when you look at what was done, I mean, just to put this in context, Silicon Valley Bank was a venture capital piggy bank the average account size was a million dollars. The average uninsured account size was $4 million. Its loan book rose and fell with the IPO calendar. If there was ever a textbook definition that Tim Geithner was thinking about a decade ago when he said, all right, after this bailout, you're on your own, you have to do your own proper underwriting, this would have been it. This would have been the perfect time for the federal government to say, you made some underwriting mistakes, uninsured depositors are going to take a hit the way they have in many FDIC resolutions going back 50 years. And yet, all of the uninsured depositors got bailed out. And not only that, the banks in general were given the opportunity to post collateral at the Fed and borrow 100 cents on the dollar, even if the collateral was worth less because of higher rates. So you saw these two unprecedented things taking place. It's just kind of a signal to me that whatever the issue is, the Fed, the Treasury, the OCC, whoever, are going to do whatever they can to help these regional banks navigate the real estate apocalypse and all the other things affecting them. So whenever you have a sector that everybody thinks is going to do terribly and they have massive amounts of government support, it occurs to me that they may do better than the low expectations people have of them. 
Listen, Michael, it's been great to spend time with you. The last sort of question, I guess, would be any advice that you would have for investors, but also a lot of the people that will listen to this will be on the corporate side. So just anything for corporate treasurers, CFOs, CEOs. So we had this inflation spike, right? The Fed obviously underestimated the ammunition and unspent gunpowder potential of all the fiscal and monetary stimulus. You get the explosion in inflation, and now it's rolling over, supply chains are normalizing, used car prices are coming down. So now we're on, on the back end of the inflation. But longer term, a world in which there's less globalization and more countries nationalizing their supply chains, the semiconductor facility that TSMC is building in Arizona, the chips are going to cost three to four times what they would in Taiwan. You and I have talked about this before, but in a world of a lot of renewable energy, you have to still build and maintain all this backup thermal capacity in the form of natural gas combined cycle plants. Somebody's got to pay for that. Taxpayers, rate payers, doesn't matter. So a deglobalizing world that is simultaneously trying to go down an expensive renewable transition, that's going to be inflationary. So my advice to corporate treasurers is watch what happens here. But as you start getting closer to the 10-year at 4%, that's probably as good as it's going to get. And then as you roll out over time, I think you're eventually going to start to see that 2% target that the Fed turn into 25 or 2 and 3 quarters. Great. That's very interesting. I mean, it hasn't happened yet, but it does feel like there's a lot of structural pieces as you've identified, including an aging workforce that will lead to a more inflationary environment over time. Yeah. Awesome. Michael, as always, such a pleasure. Thanks for spending time with me. You're welcome. So long. Thanks for listening to What's the Deal? If you've enjoyed this conversation, we hope you'll review, rate, and subscribe to J.P. Morgan's Making Sense to stay on top of the latest industry news and trends. Available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. To stay ahead of the curve, sign up for J.P. Morgan's In Context newsletter, packed full of market views and expert insights delivered straight to you. To subscribe, just visit jpmorgan.com forward slash in hyphen context. This material was prepared by the Investment Banking Group of J.P. Morgan Securities, LLC, and not the firm's research department. It is for informational purposes only and is not intended as an offer or solicitation for the purchase, sale, or tender of any financial instrument.